A good morning and welcome in to Mining Stock Daily in this week's long form episode as we get you through your last day of trading for the weekend into the weekend. We have a very special guest here this week for the long form. We're happy to welcome in from the Bullion Reserve, Mr. Simon Mikhailovich. Uh, Simon and I go in, in depth not only about gold and what we're seeing in the gold trade right now, which is important. But we dive into Simon's past and obviously his his immigration from the Soviet Union to the United States and how that has shaped his uh, approach, not only to watching events around the world, but also why his thesis on gold has been stronger now than ever before. It's a great conversation, a lot of context, a lot of personal stories and history in there. We're then kind of talking about how he's watching this gold trade and why such the sudden and violent move upwards to $2,400 per ounce. So great conversation with Simon. I really appreciate his time for coming onto the podcast for the first time. Special thank you to Fireweed Metals, Arizona Sonoran Copper, Visla Silver, and Victoria Gold for their continued support of the Mining Stock Daily podcast. And if you missed any of the previous episodes and corporate updates this week, you can find all of those at miningstockdaily.com. And while we're at it, if you wouldn't mind to leave a review, press that like, subscribe, and share buttons with your friends. I appreciate any sort of constructive feedback. All right, everybody. Here is a very timely and fortuitous conversation with my guest, Simon Mikhailovich. Be well. Uh, Mr. Simon Mikhailovich, thank you so much for giving us some of your time here on Mining Stock Daily. Good to have you. Thank you for having me. Yeah. Uh, I, the timing of this I, is incredible. For the first time we've ever had you on this podcast in the seven or so years that we've been producing this content, uh, maybe the timing of this is incredibly fortuitous. Uh, we're going to spend a lot of time talking about precious metals and gold, and uh, we should. It's been, it had an incredible run here over the last uh, few months here, and we're going to get to that. But I think before we kind of talk about precious metals and the Bullion Reserve, which is your business, which you founded. Uh, I think it's important for the listeners of this episode to maybe uh, have some context about your background and how that really shaped why you are uh, such an advocate for precious metals. It also shapes how you observe the world today. Um, you emigrated to the United States from the so former Soviet Union. And I'm hoping we could spend some time uh, having you share that story a little bit and and talk to us about, you know, what life was like as a child, 60s and early 70s uh, in the Soviet Union. Well, sure. I mean, it's it's um, it's relevant to kind of uh, it's relevant to how I developed my views, because uh, when you go through certain types of experiences in your early uh, life or at any time in your life, you have a first-hand feel for things. It's sort of like trying to explain to, uh, or not trying to explain. It's like for a person who has never missed a meal to understand what hunger really feels, or for a person who has never experienced pain to feel what you know what it's like to be sick and in pain. And it's kind of similar here. I, I grew up not the former Soviet Union. I grew up in the actual Soviet Union when it was still the actual Soviet Union, and I emigrated. Uh, my family, I should say, escaped from there when it was still actual Soviet Union in the late 70s, uh, in 78, which is uh, the time when, you know, Brezhnev was still in charge of the Communist Party and uh, there was absolutely no um, uh, visible signs uh, for anybody that uh, the system was heading for trouble. But, uh, you know, among the reasons we immigrated was that we, A, politically uh, disagreed with, with uh, the Soviet regime, uh, were discriminated against and uh, felt that the system was was going nowhere. Now, in retrospect, uh, that period of the 70s uh, and, and 80s, well, we left before the 80s, and it didn't collapse for another 30 years. So I guess in the parlance of uh, financial markets, we were, quote unquote, too early, although I certainly don't feel that way. Uh, it's always better to be early than, than you know, too early than a little, just a little bit late. 
Um, anyway, so, uh, you know, in retrospect, that period uh, has been called uh, the, the era of stagnation. And it's true, there was, there was stagnation. Uh, nobody moved jobs, everything was the same year in and year out. Uh, there was no upward mobility, people, there was tremendous corruption. Uh, there was tremendous, uh, what I would say, double think, which is certain things were politically correct to say and many things were politically incorrect to say. And when you said things that were, quote unquote, politically incorrect, you could have uh, serious repercussions, both in terms of your work and, and the school, uh, if not legal trouble uh, from the, uh, you know, the, uh, security services. Uh, and so it, it was a, it was basically a highly controlled, uh, very repressive regime. But at the same time, I want to make sure people understand that they think that what I just said means that I grew up in like black and white movie uh, with barbered wire, you know, all around. That's absolutely not true. Uh, people had, you know, the sun came up every day, just like it does everywhere. And mothers made eggs for breakfast for their children and packed them off to school to be uh, told certain things in school that they had to follow. Um, people went to work, people had picnics and whatever. So it, so the important thing to understand is living in a repressive society, it's just not necessarily readily apparent to one, uh, just because, you know, how you would know, well, you know, I'm going to the street and one day I wake up and, and the colors have disappeared, it's black and white. So mm -hmm. now I know it's no longer a democracy. Now I know something has changed. No, the whole point is, Physical, uh, you know, surroundings do not change. They, they, they didn't change in Nazi Germany, and they, did, they weren't different, different in Bolshevik Russia or the Bolshevik Soviet Union, and they wouldn't be different anywhere else uh, despite the change. So I, I, the point I'm making here is that thinking that whatever is going on in the world has no bearing on you or your family or your future or the future of your money because you are not feeling or one is not feeling, I should say it correctly, uh, any personal immediate impact. They don't see it on their financial statement. They, they haven't lost a job. They, yes, you know, maybe they feel some you know, discomfort or whatever prices are higher, but they don't feel any serious change. So it's very important to understand that this is how the frog boils in the, in the slowly, mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, heating water. So living in the Soviet Union, when we started, decided to leave, in fact, most of our friends said, you're crazy. Because the risk was massive, you know, you, you had to apply, and when you applied to emigrate, you essentially declared yourself a traitor, because you, you know, how could anybody want to leave the this paradise, you know, the socialist paradise? Uh, and once you declared yourself as a traitor and you weren't allowed to leave, then you'd have no job, you'd have no means of, you know, living. You everybody would know what you contemplated, and your life essentially would be. Uh, forever in, in the Soviet Union, forever altered uh, to, to the negative. And so the risk was very high. Most people didn't want to take it. Uh, the cost was very high to make a decision like that because we were expropriated down to $100 a person. You had to pay exorbitant exit taxes, you know, visas and so forth. And you had to renounce your citizenship, for which you also had to pay uh, as a condition of being allowed to leave. And so we ended up in the West with, you know, not the proverbial, the actual, hundred dollars a person, and a suitcase, and and no documents, and so basically undocumented refugees, uh, and stayed that way for seven years. So the relevance of this, or six years, uh, the relevance of this to the current situation is as, um, you know, it's a, it's an overused cliche, and I use a lot of cliches not because I don't I can't explain things in a complicated way, because God knows I can't. Uh, it's just that the reason cliches exist is this is just a way of a pithy uh, phrase that somehow captures a certain meaning that's easy for intuitively easy for anybody to understand, like the boil, you know, the boiling frog and so forth. And so, um, you know, uh, the uh, much used uh, opening line of uh, Leo Tolstoy's Anna Karenina is all happy families are alike. Every unhappy family is unhappy in its own way, which means that success is success, and every failure has special circumstances. Um, mm -hmm. You know, and so while th there are special circumstances to what's going on, or the failure, or decline, or whatever you want to call it, crisis, every debacle has special circumstances. Let's just say it this way. So while uh, 
there's no direct comparison to my childhood or anything that literally happened in the Soviet Union to what's going on in the United States. It's different. But there, is, there are patterns and there are certain phenomena that are not of a place or of a time. They repeat over and over again uh, because another cliche, uh, the biggest lesson of history is that people don't learn from history. And because people don't learn from history, and it happens to be true, people repeat the same type of cycle and the same type of mistakes over and over and over again. And every time it happens differently, but the gist of what happens is kind of the same. And that's why empires rise and fall. And that's why societies, you know, ascend and descend. Uh, and that's been going on for centuries. And so the, what this experience informed me is in the values of tangible versus intangible, in the value of counter, or the va- not in the value, but in the seriousness of counterparty risk. It's when you think that p- promises are made to you and they will be fulfilled because that's how it's been. But when things change, the promises that have been made to you may not be fulfilled. And when they're not, well, that's called counterparty risk. Counterparty risk literally means inability or unwillingness, a party or multiple parties to a transaction of which you are part to deliver on their obligation, obligations. So a bank cannot give you back your money because they don't have the money. Lehman Brothers can't pay based on the contracts because they no longer have the money. It's not fraud. It's not like they don't want to give you the money. They just don't have the money. And so uh, that's called counterparty risk. And uh, there are many different reasons why people may not be able to fulfill their obligations, but all financial assets being promises, uh, you know, the value of having uh, alternative sources of value that are not based on the same premise, which is somebody has to do something, uh, is extremely valuable and something I learned from my childhood and from watching what happened to the Soviet Union uh, and the Never mind collapse of the Soviet Union, but I mean, really collapse of the banking system, financial system, the currency uh, that lost all value, and where people essentially who were respected members of society, you know, professor or an academician, mm. literally went from being at the top to being at the bottom, and their children, you know, speculating, uh, prostituting themselves, God forbid, to literally pay, the, you know, just, just feed themselves. It's a horrible stuff. I mean, it's happened. Uh, so, and, and I closely watched that. So, uh, to bring this to where we're talking about here is that uh, when I when we came to the United States in the seventies, and having learned all about the you know socialism and how it doesn't work in concept, not execution. It's just it's a concept that doesn't work. You can deal with them, delve into that if you want. Um, I became, you know, I, I went into, I ended up in the investment management business, college, business business school, uh, in the investment management business, and, and has been in the credit side of the investment management business, up until uh, after the 2008 crisis. And going into this 2008 crisis, uh, I became very concerned, based on my background, that the financial system had, had become unsound, that what was one of the major problems in the Soviet Union, which is central planning, um, started occurring in this country where uh, interest rates uh, are starting to be managed by the central bank. Now, people think just they live with it because that's how it's been, but you have to understand mm-hmm. that in a financialized economy where every asset is valued based on present value of future cash flows, be it stock, be it bond, be it option, uh, everything is priced using interest rates. And if interest rate is rigged or centrally planned or fixed, people take the statement as sort of some hyperbole, but it isn't. We really don't know the value of anything. We, We really just don't know because if the discount rate is not reflective of what a true market clearing risk free rate should be and what a true market clearing risk premium should be, then it's just a number that it's not clear whether it's a sound number or not, whether it reflects reality or not. So we saw, we, by we, I mean my partners and my business partners, and business. 
We saw that going into 2008 crisis and when 2008 crisis happened, or even before that, I personally started, became interested, not in gold per se, but in ways to insulate a portion of savings from uh, the risk of the financial system along the lines of what happened in many countries before, you know, Argentina, Russia, Yugoslavia, many Eastern European countries after the collapse of the Soviet Union, uh, in Austria, in Germany in the 1930s, just hasn't happened here in our lifetimes. You know, I mean, the United States has had enough debacles in the 19th century, uh, in, in depressions in, in the 1930s. It just happened, it hasn't happened to us. It has happened many times before. So when I saw that and I started examining like, what would be a way to uh, protect some of the savings from counterparty risk, from currency risk, which people hasn't, you know, paid any attention to because the dollar has been the uh, premier reserve currency. Uh, how to protect your savings from, you know, the banking system, uh, financial system, property rights, and things like that. Uh, without any untoward thought that this was for sure is going to happen, but I felt going into 08 like something was going to happen because our sp special focus was on credit derivatives and high yield credit and mortgages, and we saw the debacle coming, and so. Mm -hmm. I started thinking about it and uh, started personally got involved with gold. Uh, you know, typically as it happens, uh, as I call it, ETFs, you know, the gateway drug. So you start with ETFs and then you start thinking, what about the ETFs? What about their counterparty risks? What about the, uh, you know, the, the risks that you have with them, you know, market risk and so forth. And so uh, eventually got into physical gold and realized that physical gold is very different to all person. There are all kinds of issues. The infrastructure in the West is not very developed. And that's how I ended up uh, after 08 when I realized that nothing was fixed and the system was bailed out. But essentially, we doubled, tripled, quadrupled down on the same issues that led us to 2008. And now it's becoming, I think, more obvious that that's been the case. Mm -hmm. um, and that's how I ended up in the gold business. So I'm not in the gold business per se because, you know, my father left it for me or something. <laughs> I, this is a choice that I made uh, after 30 some years of being a money manager in, in, in credit. Yeah. You know, yeah. Credit. So this is a pr professional decision based on my conclusion as to what the situation is and what are the risks uh, in this, in the system. Yeah. That's, I think it's fast. I think it's fascinating Simon, that you, you came about this conclusion, you know, later in your career, it wasn't something, you know, you, you know, you weren't you you weren't studying MICES in college and then dove right into the gold trade uh, as a as as a, as a young professional and 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 I want to go back and you mentioned a few things I want to kind of hit on going back you mentioned uh, your family you didn't support Soviet socialism and you were ridiculed for that um, was your family capitalists. Uh, in the Soviet Union, or like, how do you, how would you frame kind of their, you know, their theory on on economics at the time? No, no, we weren't ridiculed for that because you could say that. If you said okay. that, you, you, no, you you could think that, but you couldn't say that. So one of the main features of these types of societies is what I call double think. It's where everybody or a lot of people think a certain way but in public speak a different way. So mm -hmm. it wasn't an ideological thing about like we're capitalists and we're whatever. But if, if anybody has ever actually tasted the Soviet system, and, and again, I have to say that people who are now a very, um, I don't know what, how to say it correctly, uh, who, who, who are very focused and they think that the Soviet Union, for example, did not execute socialism correctly, that there's some other way to achieve justice in the world or equality or something like that um you know it's because they have not experienced it firsthand you know like hope springs eternal and people always think that these ideas uh, are just have not been implemented correctly because they sound so good that everybody is going to be equal and everything is going to be wonderful but it, it doesn't work and it takes actual practice in life to realize that it doesn't work 
in, because humans are different, because humans are not made to not have any ambitions and not want to be better than somebody else, because a lot of people, you know, because that's the lifeblood of, of sort of uh, survival imperative is to try to better your yourself. And when you're in a society where essentially bettering yourself has a massive lid on it, and everybody is supposed to look the same, dress the same, be the same, live the same, it, it, under the surface, the system becomes over time unstable. And this is exactly what, what happened. Uh, and so it's not like we were capitalists, quote unquote, but we just realized, I mean, not only was it economic, it's, the, the important thing is it wasn't just economically unfeasible system. It was a totalitarian society. I mean, you couldn't say this and you couldn't say that. You, by the way, uh, freedom of speech was in the Soviet constitution, but it was freedom yeah. to speak for the Soviet system. I mean, you could say anything in favor of the Soviet system. Nobody held your bank. It's when you started mm -hmm. saying something against it when all the trouble developed, okay? Very quickly, by the way. Uh, and so um, so we just kept our mouth shut. So we, come, we came to the conclusion as a family that there was no future. There was no future for me. There was no future for my parents. They were already in their 40s and even early 50s, but they still had career ambitions and life ambitions, and they didn't want to live like that. And so that's kind of why we want, you know, that's why we love it. Not to mention discrimination because being Jewish. So that, yeah. that was a huge, I was serious, very serious. Uh, I, I think I think people listening are like starting to understand why this conversation is so important for where it's heading. And, 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 and when I when I first heard your story, Simon, I think I first heard that background story. Uh, it was either I think it was on Dimitri Kafinas's Hidden Forces podcast. And not that I want I, I don't want to take any thunder away from that interview. In fact, I would highly encourage anybody who's interested in your own story you you did a great job of breaking down intricacies of that in that episode and uh i'll do credit to my friend dimitri go back and listen to that um but th the reason i wanted to have that conversation now is because just in my own personal life i can somewhat make connections here simon because as a capitalist myself i in the last couple of years have noticed friends having resentment towards that type of view I have because it's not, I don't know if it's, if it's, you know, socialism is quite word, but maybe equality is the better word. And I'm not for, and I'm not against equality. What I'm for myself is like, I am for uh, equality of opportunities. What I'm not for is equality of outcomes and just kind of laying that out there. Right. The problem, the problem is that people have very strong ideological views about it. And it's understandable why somebody would think the way they do. But as I said again, this has been tried. This has been tried time and again, and it just doesn't work. And unfortunately, it's impossible to explain to people who think the way you're describing that it doesn't work. Because the ideas sound so compelling, which is why they keep coming back. You know, it's it's compelling that we're we're all human and we should all be, you know, equal. Uh, again, whether it's equal opportunity or equal outcome, that this person shouldn't have a lot more than everybody else. There's a yearning for that in the human soul, to be like everybody else and not feel like somebody is better than you or smarter than you or uh, more successful than you. But unfortunately, that's just not the way life is, and that's not the way human nature is. And so every time this has been attempted, uh, it has ended with dramatic failure and a lot of uh, bloodshed uh, in the process. And that's just the way it is. And I've lived it, and I don't, I can't even explain, you know, we can spend hours explaining why it doesn't work. Uh, and that will not convince anybody uh, because, you know, we have plenty of history. They would say, well, they should have done this. They didn't have to do that. There's just an inexorable arc to human behavior. That's just the way it is. And while it's nice to think that we can be better and, and you know, and dream, the reality is that human nature has not changed in thousands of years. It just hasn't. 
I mean, if you go read the Bible, whether you believe in it, that this is divine or origin or not, it doesn't matter. I mean, if you just read what it says about human nature, there's a lot of things there that you would say, yeah, I recognize that. I know. So they knew it 5,000 years ago that humans were like this and they're still like this. And so, I mean, I'm sorry to be sort of squishy on this and not mm -hmm. give you like one, two, three punchline agenda as to why mm. this is this way or that way. But it's just that way. And uh, people need correct incentives. Uh, when everybody's equal, suddenly there are no incentives. And if there's no incentives, then some people uh, won't stop at that. So they commit crime under that system uh, to, uh, you know, uh, become a, uh, sort of uh, illegal entrepreneurs. I mean, if you want to understand why it doesn't work, I mean, look at the war on drugs. That's all you need to do. Just a very practical thing, okay? When there's money, profit, uh, motive is involved. There's no amount of penalty and threat that can essentially stop uh, contraband, uh, importable physical goods. I mean, it's just impossible. Never been done. So look at the, any black market, any, you know, the, the war on drugs has been going on for what, 30, 40 years. It's not legal pretty much anywhere, hard drugs. And there's more and they're cheaper than ever. Well, what is that all? That's what I'm saying. It's like this human impulse cannot be contained. If there's money to be made, somebody will take the risk, no matter how high this risk, and keep taking the risk if the reward is high enough. And that's what and that's what the problem with the system with socialism is, because it outlaws uh, entrepreneurship essentially. Or to the large extent it discourages it. And then, you know, there's a joke that the Soviet Union collapsed because people got tired of wearing Bulgarian shoes. You know? <laughs> and if you've ever worn Bulgarian shoes from circa nineteen seventies, you would understand why. It's very hard to walk in shoes that don't fit. You know? So um, it, it's that. It's can't down. say I've ever worn Bulgarian shoes. So. Well, <laughs> I don't okay. know. I, I, I have. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I'll take your word for it. <laughs> Made in a socialist factory, you know, uh, yeah. design, designed by committee. So, um, so that, that's that's kind of. I, I I wish I could give you a very like hard specific answer, but it just isn't. There isn't. Well. No, and I and I and absolutely understand that. And I'd say I'm obviously I'm not an expert on you know on Soviet Union history, but you know I'm just more of an observer of what we're seeing here. And and is really part of the crux of why I wanted to have you on this podcast so much is because there's just I you know growing up through the '80s, uh, you know under Reagan and and being hardline on Soviet Union and being young when that collapse happened and then the fall of the Berlin Wall. And, you know, then we had this moment of incredible growth in the 90s and obviously the 2000s. Uh, it almost seems like the U.S. military industrial con uh, complex seemed to drive the, uh, the the global narrative. And then obviously, you know, we, we don't need to go through it. But where we're at right now is is so like, I don't know if it's if, if if I'm saddened to see it or I'm complex to see it, but I see so many different things, especially when we talk about Russia currently. There's like I almost notice like American patriotism is almost we're, we're a lot of people are willing to accept or or admit to themselves, rightly or wrongly so, that Putin's Russia has the upper hand when it comes to something like Ukraine. And the military industrial complex, which used to be a patriotic thing to support, that's lacking. And on the side of that, young young people right now, I mean, I mean, goodness, Simon, I mean, we're seeing uh you know, Gaza protests left and right. We're seeing Hezbollah flags being fl uh flown in New York City on American soil. And so there's like all this like blatant support for terrorist organizations. And I'm just like sitting back here and I was like how did we get here? In 2002, this this never would have happened. This is incredible. And you know, for so for somebody who's like lived through dramatic changes and escaped something that, you know, as Americans seemed like was a, a repressive uh, area to live in, like as you correctly stated in in Prudent Wrong, 
But, you know, how are you watching all this right now? And how does this go back to the cycles you've seen in your life's past? Well, uh, I mean, ultimately, I, that's my opinion. I, I don't know if that's true or not. But one of the reasons, uh, you know, there, there, are a lot of, there are a lot of different ways to um, approach the cyclicality of society and, and ideologies in life. And of course, you know, I'm sure many people have read It's Worth Turning. Uh, and there's a great book by Peter Turchin, um, sort of a fellow, a uh, former Soviet immigrant from mid 70s, um, who's a professor now at Connecticut College, who wrote uh, a book called um, uh, End Times, that just, just came out, who has also uh, theories, developed theory on, 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 on cycles. You can read Ray Dalio uh, on the same topic. I, the point is that there's a cyclicality to life. There's cyclicality to societies. And they're for obvious reasons, because, you know, uh, like even um, not society, but just like, uh, the, you know, the grandfather makes the money, he's entrepreneurial. You know, the children take over the business. Maybe they succeed with the business, maybe they don't succeed with the business. But a lot of times, as we know from, from real experience by third, fourth generation, uh, you know, uh, children, grandchildren inherited the money. They're living off the money. They're comfortable. They don't have the hunger. They don't have the, the same motivation. It's not true for everybody. I'm just saying it's, it's like statistically, it's more than otherwise, you know, um, because once you're not hungry, once you are comfortable, once you've never missed a meal, when you, you, you know, you don't have that urgency. It's, a, it's understandable why you wouldn't have the urgency. And, uh, you know, in our society, I mean, the real question you're asking all this about what's going on, it didn't come out from nowhere, okay? It didn't come out from nowhere. Uh, it has a lot to do with our financial system. It has a lot to do with opportunities. I mean, I remember very much when we came to this country, you know, there was a lot of activism uh, in the 60s and 70s. And then a lot of those activists became, I don't know if you remember that term, yuppies young urban mm. professionals uh, and, you know, started wearing, uh, you know, preppy clothes and all that, uh, you know, revolutionary spirit just sort of dissipated into consumerism. One way to think about that is because the economy was, was booming or appeared to be booming. There were a lot of opportunities. And so there was money to be made. There was good life to be had. Uh, and a lot of people who were agitating previously for, you know, tearing down the existing system, and there were plenty. I mean, during Vietnam War, the, the, during the assassinations, there was tremendous assassinations of uh, Robert, I mean, Robert Kennedy and Martin Luther King in the 60s, 68, you know, um, and John F. Kennedy. I mean, there was a tremendous uh, uh, amount of activism in this country where people really rejected the system. And then they all became yuppies. They all got co-opted by the system. Well. It's, is it not possible that we are watching a situation where the rebels are not getting co-opted by the system because there are no same opportunities for them as there were for their parents? And they're highly educated, many of them. And that's Peter Turchin's theory about what he calls elite overproduction. There are too many people with degrees than there are good jobs um, and career opportunities. And you can see in its extreme expression in like the government where the number of senators doesn't change because now there are more successful wealthy entrepreneurs that have made oodles of money and now they want power too and there are only 100 senators i mean w whether the number of billionaires keeps growing there's still only 100 places to uh, to go and get elected and, and go into politics you know because once you have all the money in the world many people want to take the next step it's not available and so then counter elites form who are then trying to compete with the established, with the incumbent police. And that causes all kinds of conflagrations, and we're seeing that now. So I think one of the reasons for what you're talking about definitely is a change in the system, uh, what we call, you know, sort of collapse of the American dream uh, and the change of the level of opportunity. And that in turn is very difficult to understand where that comes from, because ultimately, if you look at the... If you look at the uh, financial situation of the United States, you know, the balance sheet position of the United States, uh, we can say that 
uh, in the 80s, Reagan administration, when suddenly, as I just said, yuppies appeared because it, there were a lot mm -hmm. of opportunities to become professional, to make money, uh, and to save money and sort of consume, um, the debt started growing. So the real question to which I don't think anybody really has an answer, why did the system start failing? And by what I mean by failing, growth is supposed to come from only two places, productivity and population. So it's increased number of customers and more productive workers. Those are the only two sources of additional, creating additional value, okay? Uh, inventions and all that goes into productivity. I mean, it's something, some productivity breakthrough, okay? And suddenly, for the past 40 years, the U.S. economy has been growing, quote unquote, in reliance on increasing debt. So essentially, if the debt does not increase, we have no growth. Mm -hmm. That is not an organic situation. And it's also mathematically, does not, is not endless. And we are in the end game. I mean, when I say we're in the end game, it doesn't mean that everything collapses tomorrow. But we're basically in a situation where the debt, as you know, is growing by a trillion dollars every three months, where the interest service is growing by leaps and bounds, where we have inflationary pressures, uh, and it's not clear whether the rates can be lowered in the face of inflation. We are in a situation where the United States has essentially subsidized its population uh, through growing debt and through the uh, petrodollar system, which enabled this debt to be uh, obtained at sub-market or non-clearing market rates, at suppressed rates, because, quote unquote, Tina, there's no alternative, you know, as they say, <laughs> because, you know, uh, the petrodollar system was such that uh, commodity producing countries would sell their production for dollars, uh, and then they would recycle those dollars into uh, U.S. treasuries. And that's how the U.S. government was able to, and they had no other place to put their money. So the United States government was able then uh, to keep running deficits, which, by the way, whatever that $2 trillion deficit or $1 trillion and a half dollar deficit, it's spending in the economy that's part of GDP. So part of the problem here is we're looking, everyone's looking at these numbers, but the numbers are juiced up by debt and spending of money that basically doesn't exist, that's just been mm -hmm. created out of thin air. And so it's a very it's a very strange situation. And the only thing I can say is that all this political instability that we're experiencing, both from the right and the left, and this tremendous acrimony has accompanied all societal transitions at all times. Uh, and we are going through this process. It's not Armageddon, you know, uh, the Roman Empire has collapsed, but if anybody has been to Italy, uh, it's not the hegemonic country, but it's a lovely country. And the same thing with the British Empire and the Spanish Empire and the Portuguese Empire and the Dutch Empire and the Chinese Empire and the Russian Empire and Ottoman Empire and the Austro-Hungarian Empire. And we can go on and on and on. And, you know, uh, it's not the end of, quote unquote, the world. It's the end of a certain standard of living for a lot of people who are not cognizant of what is going on and have not taken any steps to try to protect some of their savings. I mean, that's really what it is. And then the game continues in some other form. Yeah. Mm. I, I, you know, I, this is, I'm glad you mentioned this because in the last two months when gold put on uh, $400 and it's, you know, in its price and since basically February, I was in Zurich last week and we were having conversations with a number of uh, investors and, and gold miners at the European Gold Forum. And we're watching this move. And I just kept on saying, it's like, yeah, I'm happy as an investor, not only uh, gold itself, but also the gold miners that I'm, I'm happy for this move. But this move was so violent, it's almost scary. And it makes you wonder what in the world is going on behind the scenes We've known central banks in the East have been big buyers of gold, but a lot of this action was happening 
during the paper markets in the West when they were open. Um, and so, I mean, we need to dive into this, Simon. I mean, how do you kind of, what are you seeing here in the last two months with this big move? Where are those buyers have been coming from? Is it coming from new places or is it strictly central bank buying in the East? Um, how do you kind of summarize this up and in, 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 in the, in the new, I guess, frenzy in the yellow metal? Okay, well, so what's happening for the past three or four weeks, the easiest way to say it, nobody knows. Uh, as always, when there's a move like that, you know, speculators pile in. Uh, but what I think is important is not what's happening in the last two months. The more question uh, important is what's happening for the past couple of years. And what, because that gives us a more uh, uh, balanced view in retrospect. And what we've been seeing for the past couple of years or a year and a half is that uh, Western portfolio investors have sort of abandoned gold. And you can see that from uh, the prices of the gold miners because the market for gold miners is it's a stock exchange. So this is portfolio Western portfolio investors. You know, the Chinese Communist Party doesn't buy stocks in the gold miners in New York Stock Exchange. Uh, and neither do any other central banks. They buy gold bullion, physical bullion. So it's clear that lack of interest in the miners is a direct derivative of lack of interest of the Western portfolio investor. Uh, the gold ETFs have been shedding inventory for oh, three years running, and certainly for the past year and a half. And even as they kept shedding inventory, which means that there's a margin, net marginal supply of shares selling, exceeds net marginal demand buying. Um, and when that happens, essentially, uh, the way these ETFs are organized is that they sell down some of their inventory. So we've been say, seeing this inventory being sold out uh, from the West and going to Asia. And we can see that through uh, uh, Swiss import-export statistics, where because Switzerland is, is the largest refiner of gold, about 60% of gold is refined in Switzerland. And so we can see that all this, uh, all these gold bars or Dore, which is a semi-refined gold from mine, is coming either from the United States, uh, North America, and from UK, where there are no mines. So anything coming from the UK to Switzerland is coming from the London bullion market. Uh, mm -hmm. And then all of that volume is going to, to Asia, you know. Um, mm. And so while we don't know exactly other than, well, we know what, well, we know what we're told about central bank buying. We don't know exactly what they're buying. There's a number uh, in the statistics, World Gold Council compiles statistics for annual global supply demand. There's a, there's a line item called OTC, over the count. Like nobody knows who's in that market. It's a private market. Mm -hmm. It's like high yield bonds. I mean, it's over the counter. You call the trading desk or you call a bullion dealer or you call a refiner and they say, I want to buy what? I mean, there's no exchange. It's, it's a private conversation. So that volume is up ninefold in 2023. So essentially what we've been seeing is that the price has been going up even before this latest spread, right? Uh, in the face of marginal Western negative demand, yeah? Which means that whoever is buying up gold is not only buying all the mining production that the mines are producing, and whatever other recycling, but they're also buying everything that the West is selling and then buying enough on top of that to make the price go up, okay? Because there's net marginal demand exceeds marginal supply. And what's important for people to understand that gold does not have a correlation to anything. It's not a derivative. It doesn't converge on expiration to spot or to anything at all. So any correlations with gold that you would see and what you would hear about inflation, about real interest rates, that's strictly a function of who are the marginal buyers and sellers. For the last 30, 40 years, Western speculators have been the marginal price drivers. And because they have been the marginal price drivers, their ideas about what correlation ought to be or what they think the correlation is, it's self-fulfilling prophecy. Because if you think that gold is correlation correlated to inflation and you think inflation is going up, and it's, it's called the common knowledge game. And you think that everybody else is going to think that they need to buy gold if inflation goes up. Then you're front running that move by buying gold. It's a self-fulfilling prophecy. And the next thing you see is higher inflation number comes out and there's a correlation. 
or if the traders think that it has to do with the tips curve, which is called real rates, which is a market's estimate of future real rates, then they all trade around them, or DXY, which is a dollar index. But all these correlations broken down because the Asians and the central banks, they're not buying, this has nothing to do with CPI, American CPI, whether or not it reflects inflation or not, or with American Federal Reserve or with American anything, or the Western markets. They're looking for safety. So there's, there is the only correlation that gold has that has been reliable forever, and that is inverse to confidence. Because gold does not have counterparty risk. It's the only financial asset that is nobody's promise. It is the only financial asset that is liquid globally, that is held as a neutral reserve asset by central banks, but that does not have to be held within the financial system. Legally, it doesn't have to be held in the financial system because it's a thing. It's not a financial instrument. So a thing can be transacted either directly or through various over-the-counter markets or through dealers or whatever, but it doesn't have to be on an exchange. It can be, but it doesn't have to be. So uh, between essentially three properties of gold, one of which is this independence from issuers, counterparties, promises. The second one is scarcity. Gold is genuinely scarce. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a natural element, naturally occurring element. Mm -hmm. It wasn't created by consensus or something else. Uh, there's no, humans don't control, it's not a human project, which is why it's still around. They can't, we can't mess it up. Like we, we mess things up. We tend to mess things up over time. Well, we can't mess this up. It, it is what it is. Uh, mm -hmm. And it's, and it's indestructible physically. So you're, you're looking at something that has no risk of impairing. It doesn't get impa permanent impaired. Like the stock or a bond can just get defaulted on and it's over. There's, no, there's nothing to recover. You can lose gold, but it itself doesn't disappear. It's, you know, may, people may find it later or can find it later. We do find it later, and it's as good as it's ever been. Yeah. Uh, it, mm -hmm. it, it's independent, it's scarce, and it's lasting. Now, these properties are only in high demand when people start losing confidence in promises and more, it, it, basically, bird in the hand versus many birds in the bush. Okay, so when it becomes suddenly important to people to get their money back as opposed to make money on their money, that's where demand for gold increases. And we're seeing that both from the speculative side right now and from the central bank side and from uh, our geopolitical opponent side. Because whereas gold, I'm sorry, whereas dollar did not used to uh, be thought of as having counterparty risk by taking over Russian reserves, we have demonstrated that it does have counterparty risk. That if a foreign entity or wealthy people or governments hold dollars in Western financial institutions, if the United States decides that these people's politics are not aligned with the United States, we can just take the money. That's counterparty risk. Gold doesn't have counterparty risk. That's driving demand for gold. We have a major financial issues. We, we are, you know, our interest expense is going exponential. Our debt is going exponential. Like I said, we're in the mathematical end game. It's like math. You know, every dollar of debt is somebody's asset. It's like mm -hmm. they think they're rich in, this, in these assets. But the ability to pay off these debts is becoming less and less likely as we see these debts becoming larger and larger. And the interest to service these debts is becoming larger, right? So there's, there's a wobbling of confidence there. And so people, whether they're speculators are piling in right now, but there is a fundamental demand for insurance, which was significantly lower before. And in the United States, it remains tremendously low. Because even as this is all happening, the ETFs are having basically barely any inflows. So, and the gold mm -hmm. mining stocks have gone up, but certainly not breaking out and doing anything really spectacular. So what it says to me is that if the thesis is right, if in fact we're heading into difficult times, all that demand from the West 
uh, for safety is ahead of us, not behind us. Mm. So this rally is happening while nobody cares. By nobody, I mean nobody here in the United States and in the West, in Europe. You know, if you don't, if you're not worried, if you think you're fireproof, why would you want fire insurance? I mean, it's kind of a waste of money, right? If you don't think you're ever going to burn down. So that's kind of where we are, I think, with, the, with what's going on. Uh, and you mentioned the ETFs. I mean, that has just been an absolute phenomenon. I mean, lack of inflows. In fact, I think there's been some outflows. And I, I go back, I remember a couple of years ago when I first started listening to Grant Williams' interviews, and he did this fantastic interview with Tony Deedon. Uh, this was a couple of years ago, and he was talking about investing in the GLD ETF and within the bylaws that says you're able to go exchange your shares for physical gold. And for months and months, he tried and before it became obvious to Tony that uh, they just cert- they didn't want to do that and it wasn't going to happen. <laughs> uh, I- what about that that demand, the exchange for the physical metal out of those ETFs? I mean, is that obviously that's not I don't see that ha- currently happening, but is that something that could really come back and bite the uh, I guess the hyper financialization of any asset class, but specifically in the metals? Because could we see that here in the future? I mean, of course you can see that. I mean, we don't need to get into the technicals of these ETFs, but uh, you know, people who understand financial products, you know, would know that there's a, there are two essentially models uh, of how various funds are structured. There are mutual funds uh, and they're open, they're open-ended funds. It means every time they take additional money, they create additional shares and they take money at the year end, I mean, I'm sorry, days end um, market value, right? So all transactions and mutual funds happen at the end of the day, basically, buying and selling. Then there's something called the closed-end fund, where the price of the shares trading on the exchange can be at a deep discount or premium to the underlying asset. So these ETFs are hybrids, where their uh, large bullion banks, called uh, they call them in this structure, um, authorized participants. And that would be the, you know, the HSBC of the world and JP Morgan, and they're like six or seven. Um, so yeah, when when demand for shares exceeds uh, supply of shares, they're supposed to sell the shares and then buy the gold to back the shares. Well, I mean, you can see a situation where there's demand for shares and they can't buy the gold. And so then what happens, there's no legal connection of the price of the share to the underlying asset value. I mean, you can have all kinds of disruption in both directions. If said people said they lose faith, uh, that there may not be as much gold there as they think, then then the prices can crash even though gold is there. Or the other way around, the prices can go way up uh, because that's the only way to get exposure to gold. But of course, when people chase that, they may, they may overpay. I mean, and that happened in 2008, by the way. Uh, when they overpay, you know, 15, 20% premium to underlying, and, and then that goes down. And not only do they lose the money uh, on, on the price of the underlying security, but they lose this 15, 20% premium. And suddenly, you know, you lose half your money, even though gold may have declined, you know, 10, 15%. That's so yes, those are, I, I, I've seen that happen. I've seen that happen with, uh, you know, some of these uh, structures uh, into around 2008 prices with silver, uh, particularly uh, structures. And so yes, they, they have risk, they, they have all kinds of risk. Counterparty risk, basis risk, which is the difference between the price value of the underlying and the price uh, of the shares and what they're trading. Liquidity risk, because they trade on the exchange, and if there's any interruption in the exchange trading. I mean, the important thing to understand about all this is this. It's not, it's not that complicated to just think that if you're trying to insure against trouble in the financial system, you don't buy insurance inside the financial system. It's like you don't buy insurance against collapse of Lehman Brothers from Lehman Brothers. I mean, it's just you don't, right? But people do. Like nobody would think to buy a generator, uh, you know, a backup generator, and then just plug it into a wall and say, hey, my generator is working. Isn't that wonderful? Yes, as long as there's juice in the, in the wall, it's working. But if there's no juice, forget it. So to the extent that gold is a reserve asset that, that needs to be uh, needs to be deployed as a reserve, liquidity reserve, at times when other 
uh, uh, things don't work, then owning it through like an ETF for that purpose doesn't make sense. But if people are just speculating on the price, oh, there are futures, ETFs, options, I mean, they're all kinds of things. Well, that doesn't matter whether it's gold or pork values in there or some other token. Mm -hmm. Then gold is just a token. It's a trading token. And if that's what you're, that's what you're after, then it doesn't matter. Simon, I do, I do want to spend the last couple of minutes talking about uh, the Bullion Reserve, which has been your service and business that you've uh, founded and been extremely successful with. Um, you actually have called uh, uh, Gold Bullion a deep out of the money put option on the failure of extreme monetary policies, which I think you just <laughs> eloquently went into deep detail with. Uh, but talk to us about the Bullion Reserve and really what you know quite what it is i mean how how do you service your clients and and how is it different than other kind of services and businesses within the gold bullion market that are available we, we, there's nothing special about what we do it's 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 personal service which is i guess not very common these days uh, it's not a mass product we don't market what we do it's simply a way to uh, own physical gold with access to supply chains. Because that's what one thing I understood in, uh, in exploring options is that uh, primarily they're, they're retail options. Either, either they're for high net worth individuals, the, uh, the options to buy gold are through their brokerage accounts or bank gold accounts and stuff like that. Otherwise, it's mostly, it's a very retail trade in the United States. They're basically you know, online uh, gold dealers that can ship it to you or store it to you. And there are, uh, you know, mutual, like uh, various financial products. But what there was in a sort of a private type, pro uh, private fund type structure that on the one hand, it, it was fully backed. So in other words, every, every, like it basically, TBR only owns gold. Okay. And it's not retail, it's full service. It's, it's for, you know, limited number of clients. And what clients do is essentially through this, they leg it's legal compliance, transparency, and the difference between a manager, like we're a manager, and a gold dealer is a gold dealer is on the other side of you. You know, they it's like a buyer and seller. Now, if we're not a buyer and seller, we provide a service and we charge for the service, but everything we do is at cost. Like, you know, we buy it from the refineries, we sell it to the refineries, we store it in secure logistics vaults. And it costs what it costs, and the manager organizes all that and charges a transparent fee. So this is about, it's not about anything like unusual. It's essentially everything you, you, you get in financial products, uh, audits, uh, you know, a manager who's a, who's a fiduciary, uh, you know, personal service. You get that in private funds. You just don't get it in the gold space. Like, not much. Uh, I'm sure there are some services that do. But... Uh, and that's basically all it is, is I just said, well, how do I access supply chain uh, and not be, you know, uh, essentially pay these exorbitant retail prices, uh, but at the same time, you know, have, it, have somebody else do it who is doing it professionally and on my behalf as opposed to on the other side of me. And that's really all it is. That, that, that's all it is. And then it's just managing the safety of it. And we're, we don't trade gold. We don't we just store it. And then if anybody wants it, uh, they could get their money you know, in a couple of days. And that's that. So that's, that's all it is. It's a service. It's not a product. It's not a financial product. It's a service. That's what's important to us. We, we have seen uh, Western sanctions on uh, Russian base metals, copper, aluminum, nickel type thing. And that's been relatively new in the last few days. Um, do you think any sort of similar sanctions might come down on international gold producers. I mean, within the supply chains conversation, do you think that's something that's I don't know. could happen? I don't know. I, I, I think what people need to understand is that anything can happen. Uh, we are in an extremely difficult geopolitical situation. This is truly, uh, you know, we may not think we're in world war. Our opponents think we're in world war, in a world war. Hmm. It's not a world war three uh, nuclear mushroom cloud type war. Uh, you know, they say generals always fight the last war. So our idea as to war is always like tanks and, you know, that, that type of thing. But I don't think this war, I mean, we hope that this war doesn't devolve into that, although in Ukraine and in the Middle East, it is devolving into a kinetic war. But because of the nuclear weapons and the mutually assured destruction, this really 
is a war for hegemony. And the U.S. hegemony is primarily based on not just our military, but on the financial aspects, on control of the trade, on control of the global financial system, on control of the dollar. So what's important to understand here is these areas are now being contested by very ruthless, very capable people. Whether we call them names or not, I think it's important to understand that's irrelevant. That we can call names, the point is not about the names. The point is, can you prevail or not? Do you have what it takes to prevail? Who's got what it takes to prevail? What does prevail look like? What is a rainy day? You know, is a rainy day a spring shower and you just need that $5 umbrella you picked up from the guy in the corner? Or is that 40 days and nights of rain and you need a bigger boat? You know, that, that's really the question, right? And so I think that what's important to understand in this environment is that whatever crisis we may or may not have organically on our own, you know, under our own weight, if you will, that forces from the outside are actively uh, agitating in ways we it's difficult for us to see like not a conspiracy theory but just i'm just saying there wouldn't be unreasonable at some point if, if one of our opponents wanted to put pressure on the dollar to suddenly drive up the price of gold which uh essentially cast doubt it you know it in and of itself it doesn't do anything to the dollar but it starts it causes people to start doubting, is this some sort of a currency end game? I'm just giving an example, like that would not be unreasonable. Mm -hmm. You know, that that's the kind of currency war that Jim Rickards wrote about. You know, it's the kind of trade war. Like right now, all of a sudden, you know, uh, key major uh, sea routes have been interrupted or disrupted. You know, hugely inflationary. You know, given the state of the financial system in the United States and the levels of debt in the United States and the fact that we haven't taken care of our, you know, productive, productive capacity in, in armaments and in different parts, I mean, we can be pressured and we can have serious trouble uh, because of this pressure. So I think people need to understand that not only do we have these problems organically from our own behavior, is a legacy of over borrowing and overspending. We have people that are actively trying uh, to put pressure on us in these areas, just mm -hmm. like we're trying to put pressure on them in these areas through sanctions and through blowing up their infrastructure and all kinds of stuff. So I think that people need to understand that you're not just somewhere on the moon here where none of this has anything to do with you. It, it may very well have directly something to do with us in forms that we can't even envision or totally understand. And that may be one of the reasons why suddenly there's this bid for gold, which part, partly I am sure is speculative, uh, but it's not all speculative. It, it's, it didn't start that way. So at some point it may get a life of its own, whether it's now or in some months from now. Uh, but again, this is taking place with no demand from Western portfolio investors, which is the biggest source of money in the world, okay? So you can just imagine what it looks like when they suddenly have doubts about counterparty risk and would like some protection. So I'd say insurance is to be bought when it's thought to be unnecessary, because once everybody realizes it's necessary, it's usually either not available or the price of it is, is no longer feasible. You know. Simon, thanks so much for your time. I told you I tried to keep it an hour. It went a little bit longer, and uh, I, but I really appreciate. It. What a fascinating conversation! Uh, I hope we can connect again here, and you know, in due time, and see where we're at in this gold trade, and really what's uh, transpired over the next few months. But uh, before we let you go, I know you have a Twitter account. <laughs> I, do. I think that's a great place for people to come find you. Where, where, tell us what that handle is. It's s underscore. Mikhailovich, M I K H A I L is in Lima, O V is in Victor, I C H. I'm sure it'll be on the interview. So it's basically S underscore my last name. That's my Twitter. All right. Thanks, Simon. Have yourself a great rest of your afternoon. Thank you for having me, Trevor. Bye.